um, uh, it has been a, a great experience to be able uh, to be in the brotherhood, not only of brothers across the country, but also across the world. And so uh, I always say uh, there's Alpha and there's everybody else. And so uh, if you couldn't get in, that really ain't my fault. That ain't my problem. Uh, you should have done better. Uh, but we do appreciate uh, the other members of the Divine. I call them Alpha and the Divine Eight. I'm just joking with y'all. Uh, we do appreciate the other members. My wife is a Delta, and so we appreciate the AKs and the Kappas and Omegas and the Sigmas and the Zetas and Iotas uh, and everybody, uh, Sigma Gamma Rho, everybody. Hope I didn't miss anybody. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, Alpha is, first of all, service of all, we shall transcend all. And so uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, I want to get right to this. And uh, I was contemplating um, what I wanted to focus on uh, and, and what really jumped into my spirit um, was this, and that is, and I shall title this, those of you who are familiar with church, with black churches, uh, we always say I shall tag this text. Uh, and so if I had to name this, I shall tag this text, this text, be present or have presence. Be present or have presence. You know, when you return to this campus in 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, what will they say about you? I want you to think about that. Because I think a lot of times we don't think in terms of legacy. Sure, people who are 19, 20, 21 aren't thinking about the finite period of life. They aren't thinking about life being over. Folks are thinking about life just starting. I'm 52 and that concept is not new to me in terms of legacy, in terms of what people think and what people say. When I was uh, deciding to attend uh, Magnus School in Houston, I, I chose Jack Gates High School Magnus School of Communications uh, in Houston, Texas. And when I walked onto the campus, I literally said to myself that I am going to be the best student that has ever come through this school of communications. I didn't say I want to be the best while I'm here. I didn't want to say I want to be the best up in the past up until present day. I said, I want to be the best that has ever come through this school. Meaning, I want to elevate myself in my career beyond even the folk coming behind me. Now, somebody may say, Wow, man, my goodness, that's 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 arrogant as all get out. I mean, I mean, that, that you actually would say that, that, that you would actually tell yourself that you that you want to be the best that's ever come through this school. Answer is yes. And you might say, okay, but I, I'm not understanding why. Because see, that was put it, placing a burden on me, a, a level of expectancy, a challenge to say, I'm not going to compare myself to others. I'm going to challenge myself to be as absolutely great as I can be, that I want to be able to use every single 
talent and gift that God has placed in me, has bestowed upon me, and then to take the knowledge that I have and use it and take it as far as I can go. So I'm not actually measuring myself against a group of my peers. I'm literally measuring myself against myself. as I am sitting here right now, just so I can, just so you can understand, uh, you're seeing, seeing me um, on a nine foot green screen that is behind me. And I've got seven lights here and I've got a Canon XA25 HD camera right here. And I've got an ATM Mini Pro uh, switcher right here. I've got a, a MacBook uh, Pro sitting in front of me, three iPads sitting over here, two iPhones and a Google Pixel phone uh, and an iWatch. And I've got a live view unit called an LU800, which allows me to broadcast back to my studio for me to send and receive. Uh, I've got uh, the unit over here. I've got a 30 inch monitor sitting over there. I got a computer sitting over there with six my cloud PR 4100 servers sitting over there. And I'm in complete control of all of this. I didn't need anybody to help me set it up. That I was on a deposition. I was doing a deposition in a lawsuit. I was called to be an expert witness. This was two days ago. And we were sitting there on the call and, and, and one the lawyer, the lawyer who was, uh, and he probably was eight to 10 years older than me, and he was questioning me. And at some point, uh, he was uh, remarking about something that happened. And he said, you know, it was something dealing with technical. And he said, I, 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 we, we may need to call somebody. He said, well, Mr. Martin, uh, hold on, please. And then he referenced the other attorney. He said, uh, we may need to call somebody uh, who is, uh, uh, who is younger to come sort this out. I said, I'm sorry, uh, so-and-so, uh, I'm 52. I know how to use damn technology. So you might wanna be speaking for yourself. Yeah, I actually said that. Why, why am I saying all of this to you? It's because I refuse to limit myself and refuse to allow others to limit me in terms of what I can do. And what I am describing for you is not what I did after college. This literally was how I was thinking when I was at Texas A&M. This literally was how I was thinking when I was at Jack Gates High School, Magnet School of Communications. My deal was if I want to be the absolute best, then I need to put myself in a position to do so. And that might mean I did some things that others did not want me to do. That might mean I did not go to some parties. It means I didn't roll with the frat brothers to some places. It means that I put the time to do some other different things because I wanted to be the absolute best at what I did. And there were people who I was in college with who were like, man, dog, what you doing, bro? It ain't that serious. Yes, it is. It's because I did not want in my career to be someone who was simply present. I wanted to have presence. There are people who you know right now, who you knew in high school. Think about it. How many times y'all ran, um, um, y'all ran into somebody who said, hey man, we went to high school together. And you like, I don't, I don't remember you. Happened to me one night, it was a club in Houston. His brother got really upset. I did not remember him from high school. And I was like, 
dude, what did you do? What do you mean? What did you do? Like, what did you do in high school? We had 4,000 plus students in my high school. What did you do? Bottom line, y'all, he was present. He had no presence. Now, someone may say, well, I mean, that's, that, that's wrong of you. Y'all, I, 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 I didn't remember him. I had no recollection of him. My only memory was I think we were in a P class and that was it. Sorry. There are people who come up. Man, I remember you in college. You remember me? Nope. Same thing. What, what did you do? Man, we were there together. Okay, I'll take your word for it. But what did you do? There's present and there's presence. I had a preacher say once that he said the worst thing in the world is having to preach the funeral of an irrelevant Negro. He said, I got to stand up there and literally try to figure out what to say when the person really didn't do anything. And again, I know somebody is saying, damn, bro, that's cold. No, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that you must be thinking right now about do I want to go through life being present or do I want to have presence? Do I want people to say there was value to me being in the room? There was value that this brother or sister brought to my life. And this person is doing things and did things and is helping and nurturing uh, and assisting and is moving our people forward. Uh, and that this person's voice matters and what they say matters and what they do matters and that they are creating something that's, uh, as they said, everlasting to the everlasting, that they actually have done something that folk are going to be talking about and going to be remembering, and when they are gone, that they are missed. When they leave this high school, man, we gonna miss that brother. We gonna miss that sister. When they graduate from college, we're going to miss their presence. We're going to miss them in the frat. We're going to miss them in the sorority. We're going to miss them in the Black Awareness Committee. We're going to miss them in student government. We're going to miss them uh, in the NAACP chapter. We're going to miss them in the NABJ chapter. We are going to miss because they brought so much to the table. They brought so much to the frat, so much to the campus that their presence will be missed. You don't miss somebody who was only present. You don't miss them because they weren't, they were just there. That's why you don't miss them. You, you don't miss them because they ain't do nothing. How many times, you know, you somewhere you like, man, I, 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 hey, I wish so and so was here. H how about somebody who's who's a great DJ? Man, I wish so and so was here. Presence. They brought value. They mattered. They touched us in a unique way. See, what, what I am trying to get you to see is that when we think about great people, when we celebrate distinguished alumni, when we celebrate individuals and 
buildings are named after them and streets are named after them. And um, we are honoring them with statues and we are honoring them um, we, in, in many other ways. We are, we're naming bridges after them and airports and, and things along those lines. It is because they did things that were unique. And this is way of us trying to honor who they represented. Yesterday in Atlanta, there was a dedication of a statue to the late Congressman John Lewis who passed away last year. Last month, the folks at Delta named their main building on their campus after uh, Ambassador Andrew Young, former mayor of Atlanta, former congressman, former board member of Delta Airlines. That's because they have presence. Their names will go on. Andrew Young told me this. Andrew Young is a fellow alpha. Andrew Young said that people ask him all the time his recollections about April 4th, 1968, the day Dr. King was assassinated. And Andrew Young said this, which was quite interesting. Andrew Young said, Martin is physically no longer with us. He said, Martin has been gone from us physically for 53 years. He said, but Martin is still with us because every single day, somewhere in America, in the world, he's being talked about. He said, somewhere in the world, they are playing a speech. They are reading his quotes. They're invoking his name. They are talking about his book. He said, Martin and Andrew Young just turned 89. He said, Martin is amongst us every single day. Because he had presence. He wasn't just present. He was assassinated at 39. Andrew Young has lived to 89. John Lewis passed away at 81. Reverend Joseph Lowry was 96. Um, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian was 95. We lost Vivian, Lowry, and Lewis all last year within a span of three months. They had presence. We'll be talking about them for the ages, what they did and what they meant. And so what I'm trying to get you to do is to see your life in a totally different way. I'm trying to get you to see that the work that you are doing is not inco in inconsequential. What I want you to, to understand is that the folk who you are touching today may very well remember, good or bad, what you do today. So 20 years from now, when your name comes up, what do you want the people to say about you, even if you're not there? What is it? What do you want the conversation to be 
about you and you ain't even there. If your name is in the vote, does it cause folk to frown? Does it cause folk to get mad and pissed? Does it cause folk to say, that's a bad sister. Yo, that's a bad brother. And man, I wish they were here right now. I, I, I'm not speaking y'all in terms of you no longer being here in terms of life. I, I'm talking about what if you still here? I'm talking about what if they having a conversation um, somewhere else and, and you're working. So what are they saying about you? Well, what type of presence do you have? It's always, it's always a humbling experience to get an email, a tweet, a letter from somebody who says, brother, this is what you mean. This is what you mean to me. This is what you mean to our family. This is this, this, this what you mean to our people. I was leaving the dentist here in DC. And a couple of brothers were coming down the sidewalk. One of the brothers had a pair of jeans on, had on the undershirt, commonly referred to as a wife beater. Brother had hair wasn't combed. I think he had a pick in his head, several gold teeth in his mouth. And so I'm minding my own business. I'm not thinking they know me. And I, I see, I don't assume people know me. I don't assume that I walk into a room, everybody, oh, that's Roland Martin. I don't assume that. So I introduce myself as Roland Martin. People are like, I know who you are. I'm like, I don't assume that. And the brother said, say, say, man, ain't you the brother on TV? I said, yeah, I'm Roland Martin. He said, say, bro, man, you got a whole bunch of respect from cats on the yard. Y'all, he wasn't talking about on the yard at Kansas State. He wasn't talking about on the yard at Howard. He wasn't talking about on the yard at Texas A&M. He was talking about the prison yard. He said, I want you to know, bruh, that's mad respect for you on the yard. We watch you, bruh, we listen to you. A year or so later, I was at a expo in Philadelphia. Radio One sponsored it. I was about to leave and a brother was in a boot. That, that man, I gotta talk to you. I gotta talk to you, I gotta talk to you. I, I gotta get a photo. I was like, no problem, bro. He said, no, 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 you don't understand, bro. He said, I just got out. I spent 20 years inside. He said, brother, I watch you on TV one every single day. I need you to understand you got me through. That night, I was in Philadelphia, I took the train back to DC to MC, a teacher of the year event for Friendship Public Schools. Brother stopped me and he said, man, I got out of prison two months ago. He said, introduce me to your show. That's how I got through the last three years of prison, learning from you. Ron Lester's a pollster called me. He said, Roland, I got to tell you this story. He said, a brother who owns a limo company I use, he, he said he served time in prison. He said, I told him I was going to do your show. He said, what? Roland Martin? He said, man, let that brother know when they took his TV one show off in the prison. He said, we raised holy hell and so much hell 
they had to put TV one back on the cable system. I was at the I was at uh, the casino in National Harbor, Maryland, and I'm leaving the radio one Christmas party, and the brother said, "Yo, yo, Roland Martin, dog, I fucks with you." I was like, "Now y'all, we're in a casino. It's a whole bunch of people." He's like, "No, no, you don't understand. You could ask my girl. I love you, dog. You be killing it." And I was like, bro, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. He said, nah, nah. He said, man, let me tell you something. Anybody fucks with you, I got you. I was like, bro, I appreciate it. He said, I said, bro, I appreciate that. He said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. So, y'all, he reaches down. I'm thinking, I hope this fool is not about to flash me a gun. He reaches up and he pulls his shirt up. And what I see is scar tissue on both sides. His chest had been split and there's scar tissue on both sides of his chest. Clearly his chest had been cracked open. He had been shot. He's holding the shirt up. He's like, anybody fucks with you, I got you. I was like, bruh, I appreciate it. And I had to laugh about it afterwards. But what did all of that mean? What that meant was, I can't play with this. I, I can't go to work every night then doing my TV One show for four years, News One Now. Before that, doing Washington Watch for four years. Doing the Tom Jordan Morning Show for 11 years. Spent 13 years at TV One, six years at CNN. Running three black newspapers, Houston Defender, Dallas Weekly, Dallas Examiner. Doing my show right now, Roller Martin Unfiltered. Since September 2018. Doing my commentaries on Black Information Network giving 40 and 50 speeches a year, doing MSNBC and ABC News and uh, doing a, a show that airs in the Middle East. And when a dude sent me an email last night, he's like, man, we, we, we got to get a Roland Martin unfiltered in the UK. What I'm saying is I can't play with this. What God has gifted me is the ability to speak and reach people and touch people and inform people and educate people. So I can't play with this. Black people listen and they trust and they're learning and they need, they wanna know. When I'm in Florida and a young girl walks up to me with her mama and her mama says, you don't understand. My daughter will not let me drop her off at school unless you have finished your commentary on Tom Jordan. She made me go around the block. The next day, I, it was a Saturday, that Monday I go on the air and I tell the story and I say, yo, let me thank so-and-so and I mentioned her name. I said, she 12. Y'all, I got an email saying thanks for the shout out, but I'm 11. It's 11 year old black girl listening to the commentary of a then 40 something year old black man. That's a 30 year difference, y'all. That's presence. What I need, every person who's listening to the sound of my voice to understand that I, I'm not sitting here bragging, oh man, I mean, it, you know, it's all about you. No, what I am saying is we can't play with the opportunity that we've been given.
the late Dr. Levi Watkins was one of the great, another alpha, was one of the great heart specialists at John Hopkins University. He operated on Rosa Parks and numerous civil rights folk. He used his gifts for greatness. His brother is named Donald Watkins. Their daddy was the president at Alabama State. Donald Watkins was considered one of the top lawyers in Alabama. Brilliant legal mind. Yet the same Donald Watkins being started a company. And Donald took millions from athletes and others and squandered the money, lied about the money. Right now, Donald and his son are sitting in federal prison, found guilty of criminal conduct. When they talk about Dr. Levi Watkins, when they talk about the children of their daddy, they gonna talk about the greatness of Dr. Levi Watkins and what kind of heart surgeon he was and the amazing things that he did and the surgery that he perfected and what he was able to do and how he was able to be a difference maker, they will sing his praises. And when they bring his name up, y'all, they gonna talk about what he did. Yeah, when they talk about Donald Watkins, they gonna talk about how he was a great lawyer, how he was a brilliant legal mind. Yet he wasted all of that. And at 70 some odd years old, sitting in a federal prison, his actions dictates what people are saying about him today. So what I want all of you at Kansas State to understand and all of those of you who are alphas and though all of you who are watching this in the webinar, who are watching this uh, being streamed, who are watching this on Facebook and YouTube and on Twitter, what I want you to know and understand is that the greatest of our people who we talk about today, they had presence. They were simply not present. They did not fade into the background. They did not just didn't care. No, no, they literally said, I want to be a difference maker. What black America needs today are more brothers and sisters with presence. What black America needs today are more people who are willing to speak truth. And I'm not saying this solely so you can just speak to and help 
black folks. The work that you do can be liberating for whites. You can touch and inspire them. I got a donation for my Bring the Funk fan club uh, and I read the letter on the air. The, the dude said, I'm a 70 year old white gay man. And here's my contribution because your voice matters. The first letter I got from a fan to launch my show was from a 92 year old black woman from Long Island, New York, who said, I watch you on TV one. Your voice matters. My daughter plays golf and she follows you on Facebook. And that's how I, I found out about your digital show. And she said, here's a $500 to help you. Cause she said, your voice needs to be heard. Y'all that ain't present, that's presence. And even while we sitting right here, just so y'all understand that, you know, how we, John Cheffy, right now on YouTube at 8.42, two minutes ago, posted this, hey, Roland, I'm from the UK and Caucasian. I'm a mix as most people are. I appreciate you and watch a lot of your shows. You're a wise man, thanks. So here I am, a black man in the DMV, in the DC area, broadcasting a show who's speaking to and touching somebody who's white in the UK. Y'all, I'm trying to get you to understand that God has given every single one of us a gift. And some of y'all might be journalists. Some of y'all may be doctors or lawyers or engineers. Some of y'all may be accountants. You may be assistants. You may be secretaries. You may, uh, you, you may be a garbage collectors. It, it doesn't matter. The question is, what you gonna do with this life? You got one. You got one. What are you going to do with it? There's no day that is guaranteed. There's, we can plan for the future for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I think back to a sister who was a journalist uh, in Houston um, um, and her first name was Monique and I cannot remember her first name right now, y'all. Uh, and Monique, she was a tall sister. She was like six, two, uh, and she was in a BJ and, and y'all, um, uh, she was a, a great journalist. Monique got stomach cancer. She died at 30. That was another sister I remember. And we were at a, at an NABJ conference and she was a, a, a brilliant sister, a dedicated sister, a young sister. Uh, and she was a TV anchor uh, in Oklahoma City. It was either Oklahoma City or Tulsa, she was an anchor. And y'all, she left work one night uh, and she was she was finished anchoring and she was destined to be a great star. She was she had that kind of talent and she was driving home and the red light was green and she's driving home and a dude uh, who was drunk comes plowing through. Kills her. If I'm correct. I think she was 32. What I'm trying to tell you, folk, is that every single one of us has an opportunity to do some amazing and great things just where we are, whether we're in college, whether we're in a frat, whether we're in a sorority, whether we are not, whether we are in a city, whether we are on a job, whether we're in an organization, there are some things that we can do. There's a way that we can impact our society, how we can touch our people. The question is, are you going to be present or will you have presence? And whatever decision you make is yours. But just remember, those who are present 
we don't remember. Those who were present, we don't talk about. Those who were present had no impact. But today and tomorrow and the day after that and next week and next month and next year, next decade, next century, we will always talk about the folk who had presence. You got to decide which one you gonna do. You gonna be present or you gonna have presence. Thanks a lot, folks. Let's turn to our Q&A now. Awesome, thank you so much for those words, Brother Martin, really appreciate that. I think um, a lot of what you said really resonates um, with, with all of us, especially during this time. I um, want to remind everybody in attendance, again, that if you do have questions, you can utilize the Q&A function, function um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have a question right now from Robert Simmons. He actually has two questions. Um, he says, how do you drive greatness out of others? And how do you get others in your circle to want to have presence and not just be present? I think first, um, you can't. drive greatness in someone unless they want to you can go to someone and you can say i want to help you i want to assist you but see they got to make it on they can make a decision on their own see think of think, think in terms of uh, matter of fact i was watching uh, a basketball clip the other day and um Julius Randle, who now plays for the New York Knicks. Julius Randle told a story of what Kobe Bryant told him. Kobe Bryant said, Julius, I don't care what time y'all get into a city. Um, find a gym to go shoot some baskets before you go to the hotel. He said, Julius, if you want to be great, there's some work you got to put in to be great. He said, so what I do is I go to a gym. He said, I, I, I go to a gym and, and I, I shoot for an hour or two soon as we land, before we go to the hotel, no matter what time we get in and it's late. So they went to, I forgot the city they went to. And that was a high school. And that they kept open. They called ahead and they kept the high school open for the Knicks, for Julius Randle to shoot some baskets. And the athletic director said, this is the first time we've done this since Kobe was here. And Julius Randle had gotten, when he did this, he had gotten the other Knicks players to buy into that. And so Julius was no longer going to gyms by himself. Julius was now going with almost the whole team. So the almost the whole team picked up on and followed Julius's lead, which he got from Kobe. So that's an example. Julius didn't make them do it. But what he did was he led. And when you lead, others will follow, but it's their choice to follow. And what you don't do is you, you, you don't worry about those uh, who, who, who don't show up. You don't worry about, uh, I, I gave us, and that's one, and let me look, 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 and I'm always cracking on, on the Knicks because they, you know, I'm always killing them, uh, my friends there. The Knicks have sucked for the last 20 years, y'all. They ain't won an NBA title since the original Shaft came out. The Knicks were projected to suck this year. No major free agent wants to even go to the Knicks. We're talking about the center of the universe in basketball. Right now, the New York Knicks are in fourth place in the Eastern Conference 
with a 33 and 27 record. I would dare say the Knicks are that team because of Julius Randle. Listen to what Kobe said, follow Kobe's advice, brought others along with him and elevated the play of his team. That's what leaders do. They cause others to follow. And if they don't follow, that's on them, but you don't stop leading. Hmm. Wow, well said. Uh, we don't have any questions in QA right now, but uh, we got some questions. All right, y'all, other questions, hit me up. I know some of y'all are also on YouTube and Facebook. I see y'all comments, so if y'all got questions, mm -hmm. I'll knock those out too. Uh, go right ahead, brother. Yeah, so um, let me see. I guess this was kind of kind of nitty gritty. Let's see if we can get down here. Um, so your, your lecture spoke heavily on having presence, right? Um, unfortunately, we have black brothers and sisters whose presence is felt, but due to uh, becoming a hashtag at the hand of police brutality and murders. Um, and given that current climate of police brutality, uh, just killing the black bodies, specifically in recent years, the conversation on the side of police reform has been either defund the police versus abolish the police. Which stance between defund and abolish are you on? And what strategy should be used to accomplish your particular stance? First of all, you're not gonna abolish the police. You're not. The reality is we have law enforcement for a reason. The issue is how do you reimagine police? See, the problem in this country, what we've done is we have resorted to police using them for everything. In Seattle, when they changed their policy, they stopped having the cops write tickets. They stopped having the police perform other functions that could be handled by non-police. See, what we've done in our cities and in our counties, we've actually stripped away the resources, the community service centers where folk used to go. We've now transformed our schools into essentially community service centers. Oh, go to the school for dental, for food, for help. That ain't what is school is for, for staff for school. And so what well, we got to step back and stop thinking the answer to everything in America is to hire more folk with guns and badges. San Francisco. Reimagine their police. When they get mental illness calls, they don't send the cops. They send social workers. They send mental health professionals. That's how we reimagine police. We've got to stop seeing that the answer to everything in America is to send somebody who is trained to use lethal force to stop things from happening. That's what we do. That's why you gotta get these resource officers out of schools. You can't, look, I, I, I get, you cannot have resource officers with badges and guns, body slamming students, not in schools. We in this nation have got to get out of the mindset that the gun rules everything. This is the most violent nation in the world. Our love affair with guns is an abomination and that has to stop. So we've got to have political leaders with courage and see, some of y'all who are listening might be saying, well, you know, um, uh, 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 I, 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 I hear you, uh, I hear you, but policymakers are the ones who change policy. So you can't be over here talking about, I don't vote, but I want to see some stuff change. Well, hell, who you think changes stuff? Policymakers. Those things must come together. Some great points made for sure. Um, we have another question um, from the audience. Uh, Brother Patrick Grove asks, how do you keep the bad apples from influencing those who are actually doing the right thing? 
look, you always have you always gonna have bad apples, but what you got to have folk who have courage to call out bad apples. Look, I gave a speech to I gave a speech and I said, I can't stand sorry people. I can't stand sorry teachers. It was at an education conference. I said, how many of y'all know some sorry teachers? Hands went up. I said, how many of y'all wouldn't call out sorry teachers? Hands went down. I said, see, are you trying to protect jobs? Are you, are you, are you trying to protect kids from being educated by sorry teachers? I said, y'all, let me be real clear. I don't like sorry journalists. I have told folk, you know what? You need to get your ass out of this business because you suck. I've said to people, I ain't got a problem saying to people. Because I'm being honest about sorry folk. We got to have cops who know who the thug cops are and say, hey, they ass got to go. Aisha Braveboy, Braveboy, she is the state's attorney in Prince George's County. She has created a list and says 15 cops on her list who can't testify in cases for her. She ain't even going to listen to them because they lie on the witness stand. See, we've got to be willing See, 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 part of the problem is we got too many scared folk. Look, I had some sorry frat brothers and I tell them to their face, you embarrass Alpha. You are pathetic. I know one right now who is shady and all get out and let me tell you something right now. I'm committed to getting his ass kicked out of the frat. If you're going to wear these letters, you better be a man of integrity. If you're going to wear these letters, you better be a man of character. If you're going to wear these letters and call yourself a brother, well, you're going to act like one. See, I'm not willing to be quiet. No, nah, man, I ain't going to say nothing. I don't want to get nothing. No, nah, damn that. We need more people who are not afraid to call folk out. That's what has to happen. Sure. We have another question here from Brother Rico. Uh, do you believe the NFAC or the Night Effing Around Coalition and other similar groups are a good thing for African Americans or Black people. Say it again. I'm sorry. Do you believe that? Say it again. The N NFAC, the Not Effing Around Coalition, or other similar groups um, are a good thing for African Americans or Black people. Well, well, keep in mind, Charles Cobb, who was worked with SNCC, Charles Cobb wrote the book. Uh, this nonviolent stuff will get you killed. Um, the deacons of defense, uh, I have a book of them around here. They, they were armed brothers during the civil rights movement. I'm not against black people defending themselves. I'm not against, if you wanna own a gun, that, that's you. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with it, that's you. I don't have a need for it. So I don't mind that I don't mind us having organizations. Look, if the law allows for you to have groups that look, there are gun clubs. You got these white militias. You can you can create a group like that. As long as you ain't breaking the law, we good. So I I, I don't have you know I've had the leader of of NFAC on my show, so I'm good with that. Long as you doing stuff that's for the good of our community, ain't a problem with that. Uh, we have a question that actually goes back to a lot of what you spoke about in the in the main session. Um, Brenda Hurd asks, um, as a black student attending a predominantly white institution, I find it draining to have the presence needed to make meaningful change on campus. So what advice do you have to help those of us to keep pushing to make a difference here? Brenda, you live in white America. Boo, Kansas State ain't nothing but practice for America. Kansas State ain't nothing but practice for corporate America. Texas A&M was nothing but for me but practice for mainstream media. That's just, see, uh, you, I, I feel you. I, I feel you when you say it's draining. I, I hear you. 
But hell, it was draining for the folk who came before you. Imagine what it was like for the black students who were at Kansas State in the early 1970s. Imagine what it was like for the black folks in Kansas, Topeka versus Board of Education, that led to Brown versus Board of Education. Imagine what it was like for black folks in the early 1920s. Imagine what it was like for black people in Kansas in 1900. Imagine what it was like for black people in Kansas in the 1880s and 70s, 1860s. Imagine what it was like for black folks in 1619 in Kansas. I understand. But see now, Brenda, it's your turn. I, I, I had a brother tell me that I was talking to Bernard Shaw. Bernard said, that every, he said, every generation has their turn. Now it's your turn. And see, even though you're going to Kansas State, fine. You're going to HBCU, you're going to still have to deal with that in America. This is the reality of what it means to be black in America. And so what we got to do is understand it's our turn. My wife and I raised this twi my, uh, twin nieces. They 17. They turn next. They gonna have to deal with some stuff. Our job is to put the work in. So when the next class of black students come to Kansas State, they don't have to keep fighting what you did. That's what I mean by presence, Brenda. I feel you it being draining. The stuff that we got to deal with, nobody else got to deal with. But here's the deal. Ain't nobody going to save us but us. It's as simple as that. I feel that. Um, we have a, a, another question from Reginald Russell here. What do you think about the teacher in Greensville Independent School District that still has a job after taking a picture with her foot on a black student. I'm not. I'm not familiar with with uh, that photo or that story. So uh, I don't know the details around it. So I can't answer that question. I'm just being. I don't know. Perfectly. So I can send. Somebody can send. Somebody can send me an email with it. But I, but I, I don't. I don't know anything about that. Understood. Um, we have another question here from uh, Brother John Bridges. How do we help change some of more violent communities we grew up in and or we find our families in? And how do we change the thinking in these communities of color? I think what we have to do is we have to understand when we talk about um, changing violent communities, we have to ask ourselves, why is a community violent? John Hope Bryant, good friend of mine who's the founder of Operation Hope, John said, you've never seen a riot in a neighborhood with a credit score of 700 or higher. Show me upper income and middle income neighborhoods. You know what I will show you? Low violence, non-existent violence. See, the problem that we have in this country is we don't want to confront why communities are violent. We don't want to look at the economics of the community. We don't want to look at the education of the community. We don't want to look at any of those things because what we want to do in America is we want to only address the violence with police sanction violence, and then go, why nothing change? If I don't deal with the money, I'm not dealing with the problem. Now, you asked our families. What has to happen is we cannot abandon our families. I spoke of uh, me, and my, me and my wife and my 17-year-old nieces. They were not doing well. Uh, this is the sixth or the seventh or the eighth time. My wife and I have raised my nieces. I, we raised six nieces at one time. My nieces were not doing well in the ninth grade. We said, no, 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 no. We, we didn't put all that time and invest all that damn money when y'all asses were a year and a half, raising y'all the three previous times for y'all 
to screw this thing up. You know, y'all come and live with us until y'all graduate from high school. Doc, I I would love to have an empty house where it's just me and my wife. Well, we can walk around, say and do whatever we want. And hey, we, we ain't got the way we can go where we want to. We, we don't have children. But I can't just think about me. I made the decision to say, no, they got to come with us because I've got to give them at a give them a shot at life. I've got to give them a shot at being better. I've, I've got to ensure that their children have a shot. So we have to begin to make uh, some decisions. You know, and you got folk out of here, and 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 they love to always say, "Oh, like I got this, I got this fool on on YouTube right here." Oh, Roland, stop with the victimhood excuses for violence. Deal with the home. So let me tell you why that person is stuck on stupid. They want to say, "Deal with the home." What if everybody in the home unemployed? What if the folks in that home went to inferior schools? What are the folks in that home are employed, but they're making minimum wage of seven twenty-five, and they can't live? That's why I'm fighting for fifteen dollars an hour. See, folk like uh, Tina Alonghi are part of the damn problem because they love saying, "Oh, it's the home, it's the home. Everything starts in the home." Yes, everything does start in the home. But what you going to do when you walk outside your door? What you going to do with neighbors and the community? I get the whole point about start in the home, but I cannot have a discussion about violence in America and I solely make it about what's happening in the home because if the folk in that home love Jesus and they pray and they go to church and they sit here are still being under uh, underployed and they're not making enough, what can they do to feed their family? And that's been the problem in this country where policymakers largely right wing Love saying, what about the family? Don't tell me about the family if you don't understand the importance of prenatal care. Don't tell me about the home when there are black children and Latino children and poor white children who are not getting three meals a day, but who are barely getting one and who are showing up at school and they hungry. When the Chicago public school system has to send food home with 40,000 children, don't dare tell me about the home if you don't want to talk about all of the other factors that impact violence. And that's been America's problem. We don't want to deal with the other stuff. Uh, it's very powerful. Um, definitely a lot to take in, I think. Um, we, we have another question from the audience from Brother Darian Springfield. Um, he says, first off, thank you for the encouragement to leave a legacy on the ones close to us within our community. Um, but as a recent college grad and a current PhD student, what are some advice or words of wisdom that you have on how to leave a presence, even though I'm no longer as present as I once was before? Well, when I say leave a presence, I'm talking about where you are. You, you can still do things when you left the university. You can still, you can still uh, come back. You can still um, mentor. You can still do those things. 
but it's also where you are. And so when we leave doesn't mean that everything shuts off. What it means is that uh, we've now moved to a different place. And so uh, we can say all the time, uh, Ronaldo Glover, uh, I met Ronaldo when I was uh, in Chicago um, and did not know Ray Long. Ray died of pancreatic cancer. Uh, Ray was a great alpha brother. Uh, and I really wish I knew Ray longer. I would love to right now be able um, uh, uh, to call Ray for advice and counsel. He was just an amazing brother. But Ray would always, he would talk with you and Ray would always begin, how can I be of assistance? That was his thing. How can I be of assistance? And I think that's where a lot of us have to be. We can't be fully engaged. We can't just always be there, but we can say, when you call, I'll be there. I'll be able to help as I can. How can I be of assistance? And I think that's what we do. I think that I think we still are able to touch somebody, still able to reach somebody, but we simply say, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm there to help. For me, there are things that I can't, I, 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 I can't be there physically for my alpha chapter, Pyle McCarr in Texas A&M. Uh, but I can be there financially. I can be there with the phone call. I can be there to offer assistance in other ways. So there are other ways for us to be able to impact um, our institutions. Uh, when things happen uh, at Texas A&M, because of who I am, I can pick that phone up uh, and I can sit here and I can call somebody and I can use my influence to, have, to be a difference maker with what's going on on that campus. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I have another question here. Um, it says, because of the historic experimentation and exploitation of black people in medicine, there's been a large number of black people who are afraid to get the COVID vaccine. And what are your thoughts about that? Man, I took that damn shot. I got both Moderna shot. My wife took the Pfizer shot. My two nieces got their shot. My parents got their shot. Let me tell y'all something right now. Uh, what's the flip side of death? That's my point. If you think I'm about to sit here and play around with this damn COVID vaccine, knowing full well, look, I'm sitting here working out, changing my eating habits, but I still got uh, comorbidities. I'm not about to sit here and play around with this, not when 550,000 people in America have died of the COVID-19, 3 million people worldwide. You damn right I took that vaccine. Oh, hell yes. I am not about to sit here. Uh, I ain't got no desire to check out early because somebody like, oh, no, man, because of, uh-uh, mm -mm, damn that, no. And again, if you don't want to take it, that's on you. I know folk who have died of COVID. I've seen the devastation of COVID. My frat, our frat brother, Walter Kimbrough, tweeted this. I think it was March 28th, his brother, 50, got COVID. Two weeks later, they were burying his brother. Man, you think I'm about to sit here and play games with this? Oh, hell no. Yeah, I'm, I took the damn vaccine. Had no hesitation whatsoever. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... That's how it should be. Um, as you mentioned, what's the opposite of death? So uh, we have another question from John Bridges. Um, so he, he talks about how um, some brothers and himself are in the process to, to start a, a trade school in inner city, Kansas City, called Young Bridges, um, which is to give students an outlet to have a career and give them a stepping stone to start their own businesses. So he's wondering how can they scale up with this business? Um, and also what else can you know they do to help these low income communities um, to hopefully help change the culture and pull brothers and, and sisters out of their situations? Well, I, I think um, I, I think that um, um, I, I think that 
what they're doing is critically important. Because part of the problem in the society here that it, you got some folk who literally um, got no skills. You got people ain't got no skills at all. Um, we have to also understand, and this is not, I know I'm speaking to Kansas State. Um, some of y'all asked, I did not take the Johnson Johnson shot. I did Moderna. Um, every, and this is hard, and I've had black people demand you shouldn't say that, but it's true. Y'all, it's true. Everybody not going to college. Everybody ain't supposed to go to college. First of all, the people realize that 65% of the jobs in America are literally trained at community colleges. Two-year school, not four-year. And I think what we have to we have to understand is that we need folk with skills, with skill set. We're missing that. Let me tell y'all something. I ain't sitting here uh, unclogging no toilet. I remember my dad. My dad had one of those. You know, it was five of us in the house, so I had three sisters, and there was always toilet getting clogged up. Man, he had one of those snake things. I'm like, man, I ain't doing all that. Because he's like, look, I can't afford to call no plumber. Well, I can. Do y'all understand? There are master plumbers who make six figures. Master electricians who make six figures. Y'all, when the power go out, somebody got to work on the power. Not a lawyer. Not a doctor. Let me tell you something. I describe all this technical stuff I have. Y'all, I got... 82 inch Samsung over there, computer, 50 inch TV right here, cameras, all this sort of stuff. If the power, matter of fact, when the power went out, I had to call an electrician. Oh, I got a degree. I got, I got, I got knowledge, skills. That ain't what I do. What I'm trying to say is we have to make sure that our community has skill set. If there are people in our community who have decided they do not want to go to college, fine. We got to make sure folk have skill set. Somebody sit here tweeted on YouTube, I make $45 an hour with my GED. All I'm simply saying, y'all, what y'all are doing, that's what you do. And what you do is you just keep building. You make it go to scale by going from one school to two, two to four, four to eight. You just keep building. That's what you do. You keep building. Absolutely. We have another question here from Rico. What do you believe in regards to integration versus separation from white society? Questions arise due to the repression and oppression African-American and Black people have been victim to. You ain't separating from white folk. Where? Show me where. Please show me uh, an all black society outside of African nations. Please show me, in hell, you gonna run to some white folks in African nations. That train is left, that train being left, that train ain't never coming back. Um, so I'm not sure if you've seen the movie, uh, One Night in Miami, um, from Regina yep, King. I've seen it. Uh, I've texted Regina King, told her how absolutely amazing that movie is. Incredible. Um, I, I agree with you as well. It's one of my favorites this year. So in, in the film, there's that debate between Sam Cooke and, and Malcolm X about how they utilize their platforms to advance the struggle. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on that specifically, because I feel like that conversation mirrors a lot of conversations happening today about um, what's the correct way to protest or to help advance the struggle of black people. Um, you know, so what would you say to younger people who are sort of confused or don't know how to go about um, contributing to a specific cause and, and finding their presence within that space? Well, I think the first thing that you got to do, and this is all the time, first thing you got to do is you just got to ask, who, who, who are you? 
Look, there are some people who are introverts. There are some people who are extroverts. Then you got to decide, you know, what's my gifting? What's, what's my purpose? Um, Y'all should go to YouTube and watch my interview with Reverend Dr. James Lawson. Reverend Dr. Lawson was the brother who called Dr. King to come to Memphis. And Reverend Lawson told me, he said, my last image, he said, my last memory of Martin was me being on the last pew at that church and Martin in the pulpit, Mason Temple in uh, Memphis. And he said, I was right where I was supposed to be. And Martin was right where he was supposed to be. Lawson understood everybody, like in the movie Get On Up by James Brown, everybody can't be center stage with the microphone. They just can't. Everybody, my first, when I, I went to communications high school, Jack Yates, they would not allow us to go into the TV studio our first semester of my sophomore year. So the second semester, first day, um, Mary Waits unlocks the door and all the students rush in and they all rush to the set. And I hang back and I say, um, where does the person sit who tell them what to do? And Mary Waits said, they sitting there in the control room. I said, I'll be in the control room. See, people see me, they see this logo, they, they, they see me on air, they don't realize I don't want to be on air. I learned the skill set on air, but I learned the skill set behind the camera. The only reason I did the on air piece because that came with it and I had the power that came with it. I was a host and managing editor. If TV once said, we just want you to be the host and you don't have control of the content, I would turn the job down. If Tom Jonah said, I want you to do a segment on my show, um, but you don't get to decide the content, we do. I wouldn't have done it. I understood what my gifting was. And so what people have to decide is, what role can I play? If I'm good with money, but I'm not trying to sit here and be out there marching and protesting and strategizing, let me go work in accounting for the movement. If I'm a lawyer, I'm not trying to get out there and carry a sign and protest and get in folk face. But somebody got to bail the protesters out of jail. I, you know what? I, 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 I may not be a lawyer. I may not be an accountant. I don't know none of that stuff. Guess what? I make signs. I'm going to make signs. You got to play your position. Somebody said right here. Uh, yep. No position and purpose. That's it. Figure out what position you want to play and then walk in your purpose. Mm -hmm. Walk in your purpose. Uh, I believe this has to be the last question. We're running out of time. Um, let me see here. Here we go. You've been in this career for a long time and have contributed to coverage about police brutality for years. More often than not, Black people don't see just slash fair verdicts when it relates to police violence. But after the most recent verdict from the Derek Chauvin trial, some are leaning into hope that we may be seeing progress. How are you managing your expectations when it comes to the results of that trial? It is very hard for, 
It's very hard for our people to sometimes admit that things are changing, albeit slowly. Um, I, I was watching a movie on HBO. And it's the movie about LBJ. Uh, and I'm gonna pull up in a second. And Anthony Mackie plays Dr. King. And in the movie, there's a certain scene, and I'm familiar with this because I've, I've read uh, numerous accounts about this. In, in 1964, uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, led by Fannie Lou Hamer, Bob Moses of SNCC, they went to Atlantic City and they wanted to challenge, they wanted to challenge um, the all white delegation from Mississippi. And they went there and they were protesting, they were fighting and LBJ uh, did not want to lose the South. He wanted to win the White House. So he sent Walter Ruther, who led the AFL, to Atlantic City to tell King, you better take this compromise or we gonna take your money. There, there are lessons in that. The first lesson is black folk, we got to fund our own movements so whites don't pull our money and therefore the movement craters. That's first. But the second thing is, and, and the, movie, the movie is called All the Way, All the Way. Fascinating movie, I've watched it literally 10 times. Brian Cranston does an amazing job as LBJ, is based upon the Broadway play where he played LBJ. But there's a scene in the movie where Vice President Hubert Humphrey comes out and says, here's the compromise. We will seat two delegates from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, one black, one white. And we have gotten assurances and the agreement that there will be no future segregated delegations in the Democratic Party. And Dr. King had already been threatened to take, his, take the money from the movement. And Bob Moses was angry at Dr. King. In fact, if you read uh, Nick Cott's book, I believe it was Nick Cott's book, K-O-T-Z, on LBJ and King called Judgment Days, that Bob Moses and others were so angry at MLK and Bayard Rustin for accepting the compromise. We didn't come here for two seats. And King said, is it a deal that I want? No. He said, but if taking this deal means that we will end segregated delegations in the future, I'm willing to take that deal. That's a hard pill for a lot of us to, small, to swallow. Because when we fight, we want all of it. But I need us to understand, and again, I am not saying that anybody who is listening to the sound of my voice, who is watching this right now, to accept less than, but I do need people to understand. Jason Van Dyke went on trial, was indicted, and was convicted for the death of Laquan McDonald. Derek Chauvin 
was indicted, was tried and convicted for the death of George Floyd. The cop who shot and killed Dante Wright was charged two days later. We have seen in the last five years a shift in public opinion. We have seen in the last five years far more juries willing to consider evidence against cops. We have seen what happens when black folks and white folks and Latinos elect district attorneys and black state attorney generals who are willing to prosecute cases far different than previous DAs. We have witnessed Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore and Kim Fox uh, in Chicago. And we have witnessed uh, a new DA kicking the sister out, Jackie Lacey, who was trash in Los Angeles and Larry Krasner in Philadelphia. We're seeing, uh, we're, we are seeing Stephanie Morales here in Virginia. We're seeing Aisha Brave Boy uh, in Prince George's County. We're seeing Aramis Ayala, uh, who was in the first black state's, attor state's attorney in Florida, who chose not to run for reelection because of the pressure that was put on her, but she was succeeded by her sister. But I need our folk to understand is that progress is happening, but our job is not to be satisfied. I'll leave y'all with this. My, one of the favorite scenes I have comes from the movie Malcolm X. And as that scene where Brother Johnson had been beaten by cops and Denzel playing Malcolm X said, call an ambulance. And they call the ambulance. And the white cop comes up to Malcolm X, played by Denzel, said, all right, break it up. You came and got what you wanted. And he said, no, I'm not satisfied. There's a white state legislator in South Carolina voted against the hate crimes bill because he said, these folk ain't never satisfied. They always want more, you damn right. So what I would say to everybody who's listening to the sound of my voice, who's watching this, we may have to accept compromises. We may have to accept less than, but it don't mean that we stop fighting for all of it. We can be thankful that they're Derek Chauvin going to prison, but we ain't stopping at Derek Chauvin. We going after every single wrong cop who shot somebody and was in the wrong, and we gonna seek accountability and justice. But we have to list, do what Malcolm X said, no, I'm not satisfied. And so that's why the sister who said that it was exhausting being black at Kansas State, sister, we ain't satisfied. I'm not satisfied with a little bit. I'm not satisfied with, oh, we're going to create a commission. We're not going to take the Confederate statue down. No, 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 no. We're going to keep fighting to bring that damn statue down. And then, the ne then, if, then if, if one of us pass away, the next generation is going to pick that sucker up and say, because see, y'all got to remember, when you run in a race and you pass the baton, both runners are actually holding on to the baton at the same time for a period of second. That means when you pass the baton, you got to make sure it is securely in the next person's hand. That has to be our position. We ain't satisfied till we get all of it, till we get full justice, till we get full equality till we get complete freedom. Hmm, complete freedom. Don't just be present, have presence. Thank you again so much, Brother Martin, for speaking on tonight's lecture. 
Uh, I've been paying attention to you since I was small and even now watching filter. So I uh, definitely appreciate hearing from you tonight. Um, thank you everyone for taking time out to attend tonight's lecture. Uh, before we sign off, make sure you follow Capital Alphas on Instagram for the remaining events of Alpha Week. Uh, but also you make sure you follow Jordan and I's podcast, Two Black Nerds, on Twitter and Instagram <laughs> and listen everywhere you get your podcast. We appreciate it so much. Again, thank you so much, everyone, and have a good night. Appreciate it. Oh, six. Oh, six. <laughs> <laughs>